Sorry. The river saints. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, that's better. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress, known the world over as the Tower of London. Now, my name is George, and today I'm going to take you on a walking tour. Now, together, we're going to walk the cobbled roads where kings and queens of England once walked. I'm going to show you some of the historic buildings and I'm going to tell you about executions! <laughs> now our story starts in the year of 1066 when William Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror, he defeated the Saxon King Harold II at the Battle of Hastings and William he was crowned King William the First of England on Christmas Day of that year. What a wonderful Christmas present I gave you. However, he continued to have to fight his newly conquered subjects as they did not take kindly to Norman domination. And to impress and overawe the citizens of London, he decided on a site just inside the eastern wall of the city where an old Roman fortress once stood. And in 1078, he authorised the building of the Royal Palace that we now know as the White Tower. The White Tower stands behind those trees. We shall see more and we will talk about it later in the tour. Now over the years, successive monarchs have added to the defensive system. And in 1220, the inner ballium of defensive wall, which has 13 towers, was built round the White Tower. And in 1280, the outer ballium of defensive wall, which has six towers, built to the south to defend against any attack that might come from the river. The third line of defence, ladies and gentlemen, right behind you. The moat or ditch, 120 foot wide, 15 foot deeper than you see today. It was designed to take the tidal flow of the River Thames twice a day into and around the moat to keep it clean. Now they brought an expert from Holland, his name was Master Walter, to dig and design the moat. Now this man was so good at his job that he dug the moat deeper than the floor of the River Thames. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, all the rubbish from all around London ended up in the moat. It became the largest and the smelliest Sets pit in London. It also became the best line of defence that any castle could ever wish to have. And now I would like you to all turn round, look at that large prominent building with the statues in it. Can you all see it? Yes. 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 This building was built for use by the Port of London Authority, which controls all shipping on the River Thames today. And as such, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Tower of London. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice building, isn't it? <laughs> You'll be glad that I pointed it out because the land immediately below and to the right has lots to do with the Tower. It is called Trinity Green on Tower Hill. And it was there between the 14th and the 18th centuries that many executions took place <laughs> and much consternation was caused when King Edward IV had the first permanent gallows erected there and no fewer than 75 men of noble birth were to lose their head by the block and axe. Now I would like you to imagine the scene up there on the day of an execution. Thousands of people would gather round the scaffold site, their prisoner having made his final speech and said his prayers would then pay the executioner for a clean, crisp, efficient execution. The prisoner would lay his neck on the block of oak and the executioner would bring down the axe, hopefully beheading in one foul swoop. Now the headsman, he would bend down to pick up the bleeding head. He'd turn to the crowd, he'd hold it aloft with the blood running down his arm. And he would declare, Behold the head of a traitor. Death to all traitors. God save the king. At that point, all of the assembled crowd would cheer, God save the king. 
The head would be impaled in a pike, carried through the narrow, dirty, dangerous streets of London, towards London Bridge, in those days the only bridge across the River Thames, where the head would be displayed for all would-be traitors to know their fate. Meanwhile, the headless body would be brought back into the Tower of London for burial. Now in a few moments we're going to walk through that archway. That's the archway of the Byward Tower built in 1280. Now as we go through the archway, I will ask you to look up at the spikes on the drop gate or portcullis. It dates from 1326. It weighs one and a half tons and it is still in working order. I will also ask you to look up at the three circular holes drilled into the stonework above our head. These are known as murder holes and they were used for the defenders to enter the waste into the car as it passed through the archway below. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to leave me some room, I will lead you through to the outer ward of the Tower of London and some more stories. I will lead you through. <laughs> Follow me. The Evangelist, which is the oldest Norman chapel in Europe. The floor below that was used by servants and retainers. But there was one other floor below ground level, which was originally a storeroom, but in later years it became a dungeon and a torture chamber. And in that cold, dark, damp, rat-infested room, there was a rack, and they would tie your wrists and your ankles, and they would pull you, stretch you, prod you, and that was just to get you out of bed in the mornings. <laughs> now, gentlemen, it is my duty, I must inform you, that it is still a torture chamber to this very day. So when you go inside, you have to look closely, because it is cunningly disguised as a gift shop. <laughs>